Thank you for that introduction. I'm really excited to be here this afternoon and to share a little bit about my mentorship journey, and that's kind of how I want to frame uh, this session. Uh, so I'm going to share some things and be very vulnerable and hopefully authentic in the process um, as I sort of talk with you about, uh, again, the power of mentorship and, and how it can hopefully help us elevate ourselves and our careers. I am from Winchester, Virginia, which is a city in Northern Virginia with a population of 27,500 people. It's the home of Patsy Cline, if any of you are fans. Um, also the home of the Apple Blossom Festival, which is modeled very largely after the Washington DC's, uh, Washington DC's Cherry Blossom Festival. The city is about 81% white and 11% black. I'm now living right outside of Jackson, Mississippi, where the racial makeup is 79% black and 18% white. So a real change in racial demographics for me. I moved to Mississippi in 2006, right after graduating from the University of Virginia School of Law, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about that later. So here I am at 10 months old. I was born to Paulette and Tyrone Marshall. My mother graduated from high school, but my father did not. She received her associate's degree and has always wanted to go complete her bachelor's. Um, has not done it yet, but I'm constantly encouraging her to do it. Uh, as I think about the power of mentorship, it really starts with my mother, and I think many of us probably have that in common. It starts with our parents. My parents divorced when I was a junior in college. Long and short, it wasn't a great marriage, uh, but the one thing that my mother encouraged both my sister and I to do is be all that we could be and to keep aiming higher. Her mother, Maddie, never received a formal education, never learned to drive, had 11 children, and died with many regrets. And that's not what my mother want, want, wanted or wants uh, for my sister and I. Uh, and as I think about the person that I sort of constantly turn to uh, with challenges that certainly come a lot in this legal profession, uh, it's, my mon it's my mother. So I consider her to be my first mentor. And again, I think a lot of us have that same sense. So next, we've got, oh, I think we, okay, this is what I want to show you next. <laughs> this is the certificate I received when I graduated from preschool. So I went to Grace Lutheran, and I'm proud to say that I integrated my preschool in 1980. 1980, y'all, not that, not that long ago. Um, so I think that bears repeating. I encountered my first sponsor at Grace Lutheran at the age of four. In the fall before we were set to graduate and head off to the big bad world of kindergarten, the school decided to hold a play. We had to audition for the parts, and I've got to say it was extremely competitive. As four-year-olds, we were extremely competitive. All the girls wanted the lead, and that included yours truly. And I can still uh, recall the evening that I was spending time going over what had to be only five lines with my mother uh, the night before the audition. I can also still recall the butterflies in my stomach as I went into school that day prepared to audition for this part. So as I go into the, into the building, I encounter a young girl who was really mean to me throughout the school year. And I could never really figure out why she was so mean to me, but nevertheless, she was. So she stops me kind of mid-hurrying past her, something I'd gotten really good about doing, and said, what part are, are you auditioning for? And I said, well, I'm, I'm auditioning for the lead. And she said, you should be the maid in this play. I couldn't form the words to respond to her. I was just that mad and that, and that disappointed. So I just started to cry. That's all I could do. And at four, that's kind of what you do. Uh, little did I know that someone was overhearing our little exchange. And that was one of my preschool teachers, Miss Klein. Now, I will say, Ms. Klein was having some challenges herself with having the first little black girl at her school. But in this instance, she really rose to, to new heights in terms of her advocacy. Uh, she heard the conversation and said to that little girl, she will not be the maid in the play. You will. And you know what else? She's getting the lead, and she's not even going to have to audition for it. And just like that, I met my first sponsor. <laughs> I can only imagine the heat that Ms. Klein took for making that decision, 
This little girl's family was very prominent in our community, hugely prominent. And I can imagine her racing home after preschool that day to say, guess what Ms. Klein did? Uh, but nevertheless, undeterred and sticking to her word, I was the lead in the play. And on the night of the play, after I took my final bow, after reciting my five lines, Ms. Klein and Ms. Fisher, my two preschool teachers, presented me with a dozen roses in front of everybody. Uh, you know, I decided at that point, at four, that I wasn't going to let race or anything else stand in my way of accomplishing the things that I wanted, because I felt like there was always going to be a Miss Klein, a sponsor in my corner, encouraging me to, to press forward. And that's what gives me the confidence today, in many ways, to press forward. And I'll say that Miss Klein continued to support me through preschool, through the remainder of that preschool year, elementary, middle, high school, and college. And hers was the first card I received when I graduated from college, and I still have it today. So I'm going to go back to that other picture you saw, this one. Kindergarten picture. Went to Frederick Douglass Elementary School in Winchester, Virginia. Armed with the confidence of that preschool experience and that nifty preschool graduation diploma, I charged off to elementary school, and here I am on picture day. Let me stop here and say it takes a large degree of vulnerability to flash up these pictures. <laughs> we all look a little different many, many years later. So when y'all are evaluating this session, I want you to be kind. She flashed up baby pictures. She flashed up high school pictures, that type stuff. I really loved elementary school. Uh, my teachers were awesome. Even my fourth grade teacher, Miss Rowan. And here's my Miss Rowan story. She laughed when the school nurse came into the classroom in fourth grade one day to tell me that I needed to start wearing glasses. Why she felt the need to publicly announce that, I still haven't figured out all these years later. But nevertheless, Ms. Rowan hears that and literally laughs out loud for everyone to hear and says, you've got to start wearing glasses. A fourth grade teacher, just one of those things that sticks with you. With the exception of that, of that story, uh, elementary school was good. And take a gander at this next one, right after the preschool certificate. That certificate of recognition. Y'all, I hated PE, hated it. I still hate working out today. Uh, and, you know, but for some reason, apparently I was good at it because I got a certificate of recognition for gym class, of all things. My mother was an athlete. She ran track, played racquetball, worked out religiously as we were growing up and still does it today. And I guess something transferred to me because I got a certificate for PE. But bigger than that, I got a new mentor. I got Miss Shiflett, my gym teacher. She was one of my biggest cheerleaders in elementary school. I turned to her for help, not just with school stuff, not just with gym, but for other classes, activities, and personal things that I was going through as my parents were kind of dealing with a struggling marriage. She made sure that I enrolled in the right classes, got involved in the right extracurricular activities that would boost my confidence, and naturally, she helped me get an appreciation for physical activity as well. That's what she was there to do. Uh, she also followed me through high, middle school, high school, and college and was front and center when I graduated from high school and the first to give me a hug when I exited the stage. Another certificate, Super Sleuth. I don't know how many of those, how many of y'all had those in your elementary schools. So Miss Charlotte Uthman was my middle school librarian. Another mentor, my third mentor, I'll say. So this is a Super Sleuth Reference Detective Award. I got it for solving a Super Sleuth contest in fourth grade. Little did I know that by participating in this little contest, I would get so much more than whatever answer it is that I got right, and certainly much more than this award. I discovered research and a librarian who would spend time with me, encouraging me to read, read, and read some more. She also encouraged me to enter the spelling bee, something I never would have done without her encouragement. I didn't win the bee, but I was able to represent our school and had a great experience in doing so. She bought me my first dictionary. Didn't have one at home. It was leather bound and impressive. And she inscribed in it to a young lady who I know will go far, and I still have it. Another thing that some of you might have had at your school, Odyssey of the Mind. Do we have any Odyssey of the Mind veterans in the room? Yes, yay, okay. So, fourth mentor, Kate Smith. And let me be clear, 
Not a science girl, not a math girl, none of those things. Uh, and my fourth grade teacher knew that, so she forced me to do Odyssey of the Mind. And for those of you who don't know, because I only saw one enthusiastic hand in the front of the room, Odyssey of the Mind is an international, and this is from their website, an international creative problem-solving program that engages students in their learning by allowing their knowledge and ideas to come to life in an exciting, productive environment. And back in my day, Odyssey of the Mind had a strong emphasis on science, technology, engineering, and math, or the STEM subjects. Now it's a little different. Uh, they still have that focus, but they also challenge students to integrate the arts as well, to kind of go beyond conventional thinking into more creative problem solving. So I'm kind of glad they've made that shift for people who would have been scared away from it, like me, in fourth grade. Ms. Smith recognized my paralyzing fear of math in particular and encouraged me to join, and I'm glad she did. I stayed with it in fourth and fifth grades and made great friendships, learned a lot, and received several honors in the process, which is wild. Uh, and because of her encouragement, for about 10 minutes, 10 in high school, I thought I wanted to be a doctor. Uh, took physics and all that went by the wayside. <laughs> But I do, again, credit Ms. Smith for me, for me even thinking that I could take physics and be successful. Uh, and I'm still very grateful for everything that she taught me. Okay, here's another moment of vulnerability. The high school picture, the class picture. Y'all remember those, and I'll say my hair would never be able to maintain that type of cur curl in this New Orleans humidity. Uh, high school is so life-changing in many respects. I wasn't fully prepared at all for what it would mean, uh, leaving, what leaving high school would mean. I remember crying like a baby on the day of graduation, like, I've got to leave my friends and family and go and be with these people I don't know. I just, I wasn't ready for all of that, and I think it really hit me like a ton of bricks. Uh, but fortunately, I had teachers like Ms. Shear and Ms. Stallings to make things a little bearable um, toward the end. So Ms. Shear was my Latin teacher and another mentor. She went to a women's college, uh, something I'd never consider doing, and here's why. I couldn't date until I was 18. Strict rule, strict rule of my mother, couldn't do it. So the thought of going to an all-girls school when I would finally have the opportunity to date and be around boys, why in the world would I want to go to a single-sex college? Uh, but nevertheless, Ms. Shear wanted me to consider it. She'd done it, thought it would be good for me. Uh, so she takes me and my cousin Luana uh, to visit her college, Randolph-Macon Women's College, over the course of an open house weekend. And y'all, I fell in love. All the energy with these women, I thought, I can't be anywhere else but at an all-women's college. Never expected that to happen. Uh, but it did. And, and after that weekend, I knew I was going to a women's college, uh, and I couldn't wait to get there. I was ready. Uh, and as it turns out, my cousin Luana ended up going to Randolph-Macon Women's College, and I went to Hollins College, which is now Hollins University in Roanoke, Virginia. Uh, and it was really the best decision of my life. And as a first-generation student, it's important to have people like Ms. Shears in your life. Uh, she recognized the importance and, dare I say it, the power of mentorship in this situation to get me beyond my surroundings and my sort of thinking about just wanting to date and interact with boys and, and, and more into possibilities of a non-traditional learning environment that would allow me to grow and thrive. Uh, and it was the best place for me. Next, I've got the recommendation letter that my English teacher, Donna Stallings, wrote. So Miss Stallings was the cool teacher in high school, and we all had one or maybe two of those. She was the one who would throw us Hershey kisses when we answered questions correctly in class. She literally had us going out and buying Hershey kisses to bring to her so that she could throw them to us when we answered questions correctly. I mean, she was overrun with bags of Hershey's kisses. She wrote the letter that helped me get into college, but more than that, as a mentor, she made sure I took the most challenging courses, the AP courses, in high school, and that I engaged in extracurricular activities that would really spotlight my concerns for my academics and my community. She, too, knew that I was a first-generation student and went out of her way to make sure I didn't fall through the cracks, something that I saw happening quite a bit with my fellow students of color 
who didn't perform as well academically. My school was about 9% black. I was one of few, but Ms. Stallings and again Ms. Shear made me feel like I was special, gifted, and worthy of the best the future could hold. So then I went off to Hollins, off to my women's college, where more mentors quickly emerged, including one of my political science professors, Professor Riley. He brought the opportunity to join the Ralph Bunch Summer Institute to me early in my junior year. So the Ralph Bunch Institute is named in honor of 1950 Nobel Peace One winner and the first African American to receive a PhD in political science, Dr. Ralph J. Bunch. A national program I never thought I'd get in. Uh, but Professor Riley made me apply, and I mean literally made me apply, and he wrote me a beautiful letter of recommendation emphasizing my first-generation background, academic record, and need to be exposed uh, to other students of color with bright futures. I got in and had a wonderful experience meeting and engaging with nine of the smartest black people I'd ever met. Uh, at Hollins, I was one of three black girls in my class, so it was really enlightening for me to be in a situation and exposed to people who had the same drive and had the same objectives that I wanted for my life. I learned a lot from my fellow bunchies, as we were called, and happily stay in touch with many of them today, including one who's from Mississippi. I'd never met anyone else from Mississippi, but I meet, meet Keisha Greer there. Keisha's from Jackson, so is my husband, and 12 years, I've been in Mississippi now, so life is just funny that way. Next, we've got the law admissions envelope. So I'm convinced that the mentors and sponsors that you've heard me talk about that I encountered in preschool, elementary school, middle, high school, and through college are what got me into law school, convinced of it. Without their encouragement, I never would have applied, and I certainly wouldn't have applied to the University of Virginia. I remember getting this envelope like it was yesterday. It was thin, and I thought, well, there's a rejection. I mean, don't, aren't there supposed to be big envelopes if you actually get in? This looks big on the screen, but trust me, it's a standard envelope size, letter envelope size. Uh, I can't explain my shock when it wasn't a rejection letter. Honestly, I can't. And getting into UVA was a big deal for someone from Virginia. It's a school that, you know, even people outside of Virginia, but certainly as a Virginian that I held in high regard. Uh, so it meant a lot to get in there, and it also really changed the trajectory of my life personally and professionally. I met my husband in law school. He's from Mississippi, that's why I'm there now. Uh, so it really changed me and I'm forever indebted to everyone I met over the course of that three years. People who are some of the smartest that I've ever encountered, including my husband, James. So, next picture is of me receiving my law school degree. Uh, the photograph with Dean John Jeffries. Pictured here on graduation day, a very happy day after getting through that three years the dean of the law school at the time, and one of my biggest cheerleaders in law school. He was the person who called me to tell me that I was selected to be the law school's fifth Lewis F. Powell Fellow. So the Powell Fellowship honors former Supreme Court Justice Lewis F. Powell uh, and awards salary compensation to one law graduate uh, to connect with a public interest organization that provides free legal services to the poor. So I'd gotten that fellowship. Uh, and for a girl who never thought she'd get into law school, much less UVA, uh, I can't explain how excited I was to have gotten that call and to have gotten it from Dean Jeffries. Uh, that just meant a lot. He checked on me several times uh, during the course of my fellowship year and has remained a real source of support and encouragement as I've made transitions within the legal profession. I want to thank you all for joining me on this walk down memory lane. I hope you've kind of figured out it all had a point. I couldn't do a presentation on the power of mentorship without making it personal because I can promise you I am who I am today because of the power of mentorship. So mentors and sponsors serve different purposes, but their end goal is the same, to support you in achieving your goals. Mentors provide guidance and advice. Those wanting career advice and, and, and guidance typically seek out mentors, and at times, in some organization, mentors are assigned. Sponsors, on the other hand, advocate for you in the workplace, or in my case, in preschool, uh, when you need to be more visible, and they speak in situations where your voice may be muted in some way by your inexperience or simply by a lack of awareness of your contributions to the team. So why does mentorship matter? 
it equalizes the playing field. And I just wanted to sort of briefly talk about some of the demographics in the legal profession that make this even more prominent. So the percentage of women in the legal profession has grown by only about 5%, or from 31 to 36% from 2010 to 2016. Aggregate minority representation in the profession stood at 14.5% 14 in 2015, a drop from 15.7% in 2014. Black lawyer representation has increased very little over the last 10 years, from an average of 4.3% from 2003 to 2005 to an average of 4.8% in 2013 to 20, from 2013 to 2015. Asian American representation in the profession increased uh, from an average of 2.6 uh, to an average of 4.8. African Americans are significantly less likely to start off in private practice. 37.4% of African American law grads were initially employed in private practice compared with 53.5% of Hispanic grads, 55.6% of Asian grads, and 40. 6.6% of Native American grads, 51.4% of white grads. Asian Americans are most likely uh, to enter private practice, and law grads identifying as lesbian, gay, or bisexual are less likely than most groups to start off in private practice and more likely to start off in public interest jobs. Mentors can provide critical support to diverse attorneys in the law firm and other settings and consequently help equalize the playing field for them and their white counterparts. The guidance a mentor can provide to a diverse attorney can help her avoid the types of professional missteps that can divert her career and place her on more equal footing with her counterparts. It also creates a culture of support. So though the, the talk about the demographics and the culture of support really go hand in hand. Mentorship matters because it can help create a culture of support within an organization, particularly for diverse attorneys. The only way organizations will be able to retain women, attorneys of color, differently abled attorneys, LGBTQ attorneys, is if they feel like they are being heard in those, in those organizations and supported. Mentorship relationships can offer these attorneys some assurance that they matter and that they're essential to the organization develops and grows talents within organizations. Mentors provide guidance and help mentees avoid mistakes and make good decisions. That's really one of their priority goals. The guidance that they provide contributes to the professional development of a mentee, and that's important. And that professional development ultimately benefits the organization. If you've got people who are growing and developing, so too does your company, your organization, your firm. Mentors are able to cultivate and develop talent through their wisdom and shared experiences. And that's a critical function of the mentorship relationship for the mentee and also the organization at issue because it can do things like improve job performance, satisfaction, and retention. The other thing mentorship does, uh, or the other few things that it does, uh, is expose mentors and mentees to new ideas and perspectives. And I think this is a really big one. Uh, it's important to be able to see things from different points of view based on our, our life experiences, cultures, ethnicities, genders, etc. All of that is important to a mentee's personal growth and development, but also to the culture of organizations. Feedback, good and bad, is a gift. I will never forget the first evaluation that I got at my law firm. It was brutal. It was brutal but it was information that I needed to hear to help me grow and develop and sort of face the challenges I was facing in my role as a law firm associate. It's essential for mentors to provide direct, actionable feedback to mentors or to mentees, and, and mentees have to be willing to hear it, even when it's difficult. This matters because it's a part of that advice and guidance that I've been talking about. Mentors can provide critically needed direction and focus for mentees to help them avoid making the types of decisions that can derail or otherwise hurt their careers. And finally, it matters because it improves the workplace environment for everyone, not just the mentees. As you, as a mentor, develop a trusting relationship with your mentee, you're going to begin to learn, you're going to start to hear things and learn things about organizations, yours or others, 
that may need to be addressed generally or specifically with management level colleagues. I think it's important for mentors to use those exchanges, certainly with the consent of their mentees, to improve the workplace for everyone. That's another way that mentors can use their influence within an organization to really improve conditions throughout. And I think that's an important function of mentorship that sometimes goes overlooked. Undertaking a mentor is a serious decision, and it's one that I've had to face many times because I've been approached many times, and it's, it's something that I really enjoy doing. So I certainly encourage anyone who's asked to be a mentor to take the time to consider it fully and only do it if you can fully commit to it. Here are some of the things to think about kind of under the category of Mentorship 101 for mentors. Set expectations. Decide when and how often you want to meet. Will it be by person or by phone? If by phone, when is okay? Can they call you 6 o'clock in the morning, 10 o'clock at night? What are going to be kind of the boundaries, the ground rules for that relationship? Are you fine with receiving text messages? I have a mentee who I don't think she has the ability, her phone must not make calls because the only way we communicate is by text. That's it. And I'm fine with that and she knows that I am. But by setting those expectations for mentorship, for that relationship, you'll avoid those awkward problems and, and miscommunications in the future. So go ahead and set those, set those guidelines from the beginning. Spend time listening. You are certainly the mentor, so the chances are pretty high that you're going to probably be the person that's doing a lot of the talking. Uh, although in my, in my situations, and I think in most, that's not necessarily the true, truth, but you do need to be listening too. And by listening, you're going to find out what your mentors want. You're going to hear about their weaknesses, their strengths, how they handle certain situations, how they handle pressure. You'll also get to know them on a personal level just by listening and therefore be able to give them the advice that works best for them. Don't treat it like a transaction. Instead, take the time to understand your mentee's career paths, goals, hopes, fears, and lifestyle so that the advice that you give them can have a transformative impact on their lives. Acknowledging generational differences. This is a big one. Mentorship should not be paternalistic. This is not, I am the beholder of all of the wisdom and information, here to give it to you, little lowly person. That's not what sort of situation this should be. You can learn a lot from your mentee, and it really should be a reciprocal relationship. You have to realize that your world and vision of what is acceptable behavior, dress, language, expectations may be very different from this person who might have graduated 5, 10, or 20 years later than you did. I saw a tweet recently that said, everybody hates millennials until they need a Word document converted into a PDF. <laughs> and it's funny, but it's also very true. We need to recognize the real and not the assumed value people of all places, of all ages bring to our workplaces. We also need to recognize that people approach things differently based on the generation they're born in. And if you undertake a mentor relationship, check your own biases and preconceptions at the door and spend time learning about the generation of your mentee so that you can be most helpful to her in the process. It's far easier to disparage than to actively listen and learn in order to change challenges into opportunities within that mentorship relationship to impact both your mentee and your outlook as a whole. So it's important to recognize those, as those differences. Uh, and also acknowledge that you don't have all the answers. You have a lot of wisdom. That's why this person has approached you and said, will you be my mentor? You, you have something that that person wants uh, and experiences that they think they can learn from. But don't dare limit your mentee to only learning the things that you can teach. Look for opportunities, be it an online course, be it a webinar, be it a Clio Cloud conference. Where are there opportunities where this person could learn some things that I can't necessarily teach him or her? That's important. Connect them with others who have expertise in areas that you do not. I make those introductions all the time with my mentees to attorneys who practice in areas that not only I don't practice, but never would want to. Uh, so they, would get, they can get from them information that I just don't have the capacity to share. 
Those folks may never become their mentors, but that's not really the function of that establishment of that relationship. It's the opportunity for them to be exposed to something that you as a mentor cannot expose them to. So I think that's very important. More things for mentors to consider. Honesty is the best policy. Don't hide your mistakes. You're doing your mentee a disservice. You've had to fall, you've fallen, and you've gotten back up. And how they learn is from those experiences. Uh, so be open and honest, and that really helps establish a trusting relationship with your mentee. That will also, in turn, make them more open and at ease with sharing their mistakes as they seek you out for guidance. If you hold back to protect your mentee's feelings or protect yourself, you're really not helping them. And that's not what this relationship is about. Celebrating their accomplishments. This is a fun one. You know, when your mentee completes a big task, uh, passes the bar, you know, a project, meets a major deadline, argues a motion, uh, call them and congratulate them. Take them to lunch. Take them for a drink. When you celebrate their achievements, you'll not only make them feel good in that moment, you'll help grow their confidence, which is so essential to this process, that confidence building. Complimenting, encouraging, celebrating a job well done will set your mentee up for a bright future in the workplace and beyond, and that's critical. Using the information gleaned from your mentor relationship to improve your, work, your workplace, and I mentioned that before. Mentorship matters because it really does allow mentors to stay abreast of what's happening in their own workplaces, but also more generally in their chosen professions. And as you interact with mentees, you're going to learn things that are going to help you improve the workplace for them and everyone else there. Good example, if your mentee shares something about a policy of your firm or organization that you might not have known about, that sounds a little problematic. You have the ability and the influence to make some changes there that can impact not only the situation that has become challenging for your mentee, but a situation that's probably challenging for many other people within your organization. So I think it's important to use those opportunities to affect more systemic change based on the conversations you have with mentees. And above all, be available. If you can't properly invest in being a mentor, don't do it. Just don't do it. I hate when I hear from law students and young attorneys who come to me and say they reached out to someone, this person agreed to be their mentor, and they ended up ghosting them. They didn't respond to calls, didn't respond to emails, failed to show up for an in-person visit, just disappeared, became MIA. Don't do that. Don't do that. It goes back to that first bullet point, the setting the expectations. If you're going to be busy and you can't fully commit to the mentor relationship, you're going to miss a call, you're going to miss a visit, let the mentee know. And if maintaining the relationship becomes more than you can do, try to get them with somebody else who has more time. And if you're not the right fit, try to get them with someone else who is. Don't leave them hanging. They came to you because they felt like they had a need for some guidance, some support, some advice. It's likely you can find someone who can provide that for them if you're not the right person. So I think, you know, it's, it's important to be available, and if you can't, try to find ways to still make sure they can get what they need at that time in their career journey. So we've given some advice for our mentors. Now to our mentees, folks who are thinking about approaching someone to develop a mentorship relationship. Have a plan. Find someone whose career path aligns with your goals. And even more to the point, reach out to people who are living your dream, what you want out of your professional life. Find somebody who specializes in your field and who can support you where you are in your career journey. Approach them with your interest in developing a mentor relationship and be clear about your expectations for it which means take the time to figure out what your expectations are for it before you approach them with it. And know what you're looking for and assure them that you're going to take that relationship seriously. And that's critical because if someone's going to invest the time and energy in you, they need to know that you're serious about it and that you value that time and that commitment and that investment they're making in you. And along those same lines, when you're meeting with your mentor, come prepared. So you're not just going hanging out with your girls having a drink. This is a professional relationship. You're meeting with your mentor, the person from whom you hope to glean a lot of wisdom and advice and experience to help you in your career. So have a plan for your meetings and work hard to sort of stick to the agenda that you establish early on 
for your interactions with your mentor. Building trust. Biggest way to do that, follow through. Follow through on what you're going to say you're going to do and be reliable. Don't flake on meetings. And if you're going to have to be late or miss an appointment, get in touch with your mentor as soon as possible. This is where having the text are good. I'll get the running a little bit late text, and that's fine, as long as I know. Um, so that kind of stuff matters. And just be consistent in your interactions. When you're consistent over time, you build that trust. That's so valuable in this mentorship relationship. Be willing to listen and accept feedback. Uh, and, and it sounds a whole lot simpler than it is because you think, well, I'm going to this person for their feedback, for their guidance, so of course I'm going to be listening. But sometimes that gets hard. Uh, your mentor has agreed to invest in you, so you have to be willing to listen and be receptive to what he or she has to share, even when it's critical. Going back to that feedback, you must trust that the feedback comes from a good place. It comes from a place of this person wanted to do everything they can to help you get where you want to be and to help you visualize opportunities that you never would have seen for yourself. And sometimes that's not always comfortable. So you got to be prepared for that. But it helps you discover who you are. And when you're holding yourself back with self-limiting or self-deprecating thoughts that we sometimes do, a mentor can help you put those thoughts to the side and help you think about shooting for the moon which is very important. More things to think about, respecting your mentor's time, going back to some of the other things we, we were talking about, showing your mentor that you value her time and that you're, you're being serious about it and you're using it wisely. You're not meeting just to catch up on things or ask questions that you can find out on your own. You really want to utilize this person's time and space and experiences as, as seriously and as intensely as you can, coming with thoughtful questions and being ready to discuss the real challenges that you're facing, using this time wisely, and then listening carefully to recommendations and reporting back on your progress. I think that's another big one. There are times when I will spend with my mentees and we'll spend 30, 45, two hours, you know, talking about things, and I'll sort of say, no, here are some of the things I want you to think about. So then we'll get back together again three, four weeks later, and it's like none of that happened four weeks before. <laughs> I need to know how things have gone over the last four weeks. Report back, you know, and even if, oh, I didn't have a chance to focus so much on this because I've been working on this, that's fine. That's a part of the conversation. But you feel like as a mentor, if you're having impact, if you're getting that sort of feedback about what your recommendations, the impact your recommendations had on your mentee's experience. So that's all a part of respecting the mentor's time. And it makes you as a mentor want to continue to invest in the mentee if you're feeling like they're acting on your input and if they see that you're, if you can see that your impact, is, your impact is really making them make better choices. So more things for mentees to think about, respecting your mentor's confidentiality. So I talked about how honesty is the best policy for mentors, and you're going to share a lot of things about your failures, your shortcomings, and how you've fallen and gotten back up again. Uh, and some of that may not be stuff you want everybody in that law school or their firm or whatever organization it may be to know about. Uh, so I think it's important uh, for our mentees to respect the confidence of mentors, particularly when you're asked to do so. I mean, if it's someone who's like, look, I'm very open and honest about some of the things I've gone through, then that's a whole other situation. But if it's, this is something I'm sharing with you in confidence, then you need to respect that. Uh, and that helps you build and maintain that trusting mentorship relationship. It also shows respect for your mentor's vulnerability. Because this, again, is a two-way street. I'm sharing, you're sharing. Uh, so it's important to, to respect that as well and keeping those discussions between the two of you as much as possible and certainly if you're directed to do so. It's more than okay to have more than one mentor. And I hope that this is something that's that a, not a new concept. Um, it's important to have different perspectives to bring to bear on some of your biggest challenges. Um, you might not have full-on mentorship relationships with everybody. They may not be formal mentors. But having conversations with a, a, a good group of people, it's good for you to have that, to have those seasoned operators in your life advising you and helping you think, of, think through the steps that you're taking. Another tip, of course, is not to just look for mentors at your organization. 
there will be times when you're going to want to talk about people in your organization. Um, so you might not want to talk with somebody who's in the organization about the people within your organization. So looking outside of that uh, for also people who can, you know, provide you a safe space to ask questions and to express concerns, I think it's also very important. So, you know, what I've tried to do throughout this is not just sort of frame it in a conversation of you've been assigned this mentor at work and here's what the relationship looks like, but to also kind of think about the fact that many of us have mentors who are people we don't work with. Um, so I think that those relationships are also very important. And above all, for our mentees, two-way street, finding the right mentorship match and nurturing that connection requires diligence, preparation, and continually asking yourself questions that sort of keep that relationship moving forward. How at, when, when it works, it can really lead to jobs, it can lead to new disciplines, and wonderfully, a lifelong friendship. And, and it's wonderful when that happens. So it's important to invest the time and recognize that it is a two-way street and that you're really the driver in this relationship. Uh, and so steer carefully and thoughtfully to make sure you end up in your intended destination. So I want to talk for just a second about why sponsorship is important. Uh, and again, sponsors kind of advocate for you in the workplace and when you need to be more visible. They speak for your situations when your voice may be muted by your inexperience or simply a lack of awareness about your contributions. They elevate you and your contributions and what you mean to an organization. And I think the biggest advantage of sponsorship is that it provides access to opportunities and brings otherwise unrecognized achievements and successes and value to the attention of senior management. Why does it matter for the sponsoree? It matters because it, simply put, can mean career advancement, promotion, job satisfaction, because somebody is recognizing your contributions and again, elevating those to the top, and that's important. Studies show that sponsorship can be a turbocharger for careers. According to a recent Deloitte report, individuals who have the active support of sponsors within their organization are more likely to advance in their careers. Moreover, sponsorship can improve the chances of more stretch assignments, more promotions, and pay raises, ching, 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 by up to 30% according to that report. For the sponsor, it can be an opportunity to spot talent, promote emerging leaders within your organization. You can become known as the cultivator of talent and leaders within your organization, the talent agent, if you will. Kind of a nice position. Uh, you're helping to build that team and with the best and the brightest by sort of spotlighting those folks. Uh, and I should say, sponsorship offers a great opportunity in workplaces for men to be allies for women at work. Uh, it shouldn't matter that a male is necessarily elevating the contributions of a female, but we all know it does. So to the extent that sponsorship is embraced by male workplace counterparts, it can be very powerful. Their influence truly matters in our workplaces. Uh, and for the organization, an accelerator for diverse talent. The sponsor is off building the team, helping to create a, cult a culture of support for overlooked professionals by spotlighting their talents and achievements. The organization wins because it acknowledges those contributions of the younger and maybe less seasoned professionals, uh, which, is, which is good for promoting them uh, and also helps you retain them, which is essential for the company, retention. Like mentorship, sponsorship can be imp very important for supporting diversity and, and inclusion efforts within an organization. There's an innovative approach to sponsorship called interorganizational formal mentoring, kind of a mouthful there, that shows that facilitating sponsorship relationships as a component of formal mentoring programs is an essential element of diverse talent pipeline development. Uh, and of grooming future leaders within the organization. So that's just sort of a testament of how when mentorship and sponsorship work together, it can be incredibly powerful for an organization because you are recognizing and kind of, again, elevating those achievements of people who might not otherwise get those spotlights, but also contributing to more diverse uh, professionals who may be overlooked for other reasons. Uh, so I think that's a powerful mix. 
So just some kind of final observations. I did include a PDF of documents with links to resources about mentorship. Uh, a lot of those resources sort of help form a lot of what I've discussed today. Uh, and of course, you know, once you do one of these presentations, you submit your materials a week in advance, another article comes out that you're like, ah, I hate that this is not on my list. Uh, one came out on Tuesday, and I just want to mention that. Um, it was published on entrepreneur.com. If you will Google 10 tips to find and keep the perfect mentor, that article provides what I think is excellent advice for prospective and emerging entrepreneurs about approaching a mentor and also what to kind of expect and, again, how to maintain mentorship relationships. It's, it's an outstanding piece. Uh, it was, it's on entrepreneur.com. That's the website. It came out on October 3rd. And again, that title again is 10 Tips to Find and Keep the Perfect Mentor. Uh, and it's just sort of stories from 10 different entrepreneurs uh, who have achieved wonderful success about how they have found mentors over the years and how they have sort of shaped and molded their careers. Um, it was a great piece, and, and in light of um, this conference and um, the focus of a lot of people, I think, who are here, I think it's a piece that a lot of you would enjoy reading. I want to reiterate the importance of viewing generational differences as learning opportunities and, and not challenges in the mentorship context, but also generally in our workplace uh, interactions. Even if you're not a mentor and you don't have a mentee or any sort of relationship like that, we do need to learn and appreciate the differences uh, and the viewpoints and the ideas and the thoughts and all that wonderful stuff that we can get from other people who may be younger or older than us. Um, so it's important to know that we can learn so much from each other. And finally, get a mentor and be a mentor. We all have knowledge, skills, and experiences that someone else needs. Uh, I mentor to pay forward everything I receive from Ms. Klein, Ms. Shiflett, Ms. Smith, Ms. Shear, Ms. Stallings, Professor Riley, and Dean John Jeffries people who really shaped and, again, molded who I am today and why this was a presentation that had to be so personal for me because that, to me, has been the power of mentorship. Uh, so I try to pay it forward and, and give back of my time as much as I can. But I also have mentors. I need people to sort of keep me in check uh, and help me think through the steps that I'm taking in my professional journey because it really is a lifelong journey uh, for all of us. I've come a long way, certainly from being that shy little black girl at Grace Lutheran, uh, and each of those folks that I've talked to you about have certainly played a significant role in, in, in forming and shaping that. So I certainly appreciate y'all coming to this session. You know, it's a little different from some of the other topics uh, of the conference, uh, but mentorship is something that I believe in so seriously, and I want to thank you for allowing me the opportunity to be authentic and vulnerable. Remember those pictures? Remember that in the evaluation? Uh, and explaining the power of mentorship. And I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, if you have them. And I certainly hope y'all enjoy the rest of the conference. So thank you. I'm supposed to give you a second to get, to get the mic. <laughs> Hi. Um, thanks so much. Thanks so much. Um, my question for you is in the spirit of Clio and cloud and tech, are there any tech tools that you think about or use or have seen effectively used in mentorship or sponsorship relationships? You know, I recently, and I've not personally used it, um, and I'm, I'm going to forget the name of it, um, but there, and it actually is a woman who is a tech entrepreneur, um, a woman out of Wisconsin who developed an app specifically to link in a mentorship concept, uh, context, women legal tech entrepreneurs with other women legal tech entrepreneurs. She, so she's developed an app, a mentorship app for that purpose. And I don't think there are many out there, um, just based on the article that I read about her app in particular, suggests that there aren't. But I just love the idea of kind of linking other people together, you know, who have shared interests, who don't know how to start. And the idea behind the app, it sort of takes some of that intimidation away from it. Because I can admit you, you know, there are people who you might want to approach, but it's very intimidating to, to, you know, try to step up to someone who seems so far along in their career, has achieved so much success, and you're walking up to them and saying, will you be my mentor? You know, so something like an app, I think, can take some of that pressure off because they put themselves out there on this platform to say, 
I'm, I want to be a mentor to someone. So I'm hoping that more of those types of things will, will come out. But hers was specifically for people in the legal tech space. So that's at least one thing that's out there. Thank you. How do you advise, you know, I'm in a niche practice area, and so often I'm mentoring people who don't work for me but are interested in breaking into the field, and I run a program for our national organization on this topic. Okay. How do you advise mentors who feel that the, their mentee is taking advantage of them or, or just is so eager to get information that they don't have the time to commit that level but don't want to break off the relationship? You want to continue to mentor them, but they're sucking your time. How do you yes. advise you handle that? I think that's time for a courageous conversation between you and the mentee to just sort of talk about your time limitations and also be very forthcoming about what you can commit to. You know, I can do once a month, I can do once a quarter, uh, and then be very clear about what that meeting will look like, you know, kind of setting a, an agenda. You don't want to be rigid. Um, there needs to be some built-in flexibility, but there also has to be a respect for your time. Uh, and I think that's also when it may be appropriate to find another mentor or mentors who can sort of fill in the gaps that you're not able to fill in because of your time commitments. So I think bringing in, you know, filling that bench with a few others to provide you some support, but then also, you know, sort of courageously saying, this is just not something I can continue to commit to at this level. I still want to be involved in your life. I still want to be involved in your path, uh, but I can't continue to do it like we are right now. And I've had to have those conversations as well. And I think, you know, again, sort of the vulnerability of even, even approaching someone and starting those relationships you know, just being very honest about it throughout that relationship. As long as that, as, as long as you're honest and, and, and sincere about your needs uh, and, and your expectations, I think all along, when you have that conversation, it doesn't come out of, out of nowhere and really kind of make the experience negative in some way. Um, so, you know, maintaining it from the beginning and then when that time comes where you just kind of have to step away, I think there will be an appreciation for your honesty and candor about where you are at that point. Uh, in your life and, and what you can commit to at that point in your life. Mm -hmm. Hi, Tiffany. Thanks for all your information. I, I love it all, and I love that you're talking on this topic. I run or help run the mentoring program for the state of Illinois for new lawyers, and we run a pilot program right now specifically targeted to underrepresented lawyers um, involving mostly persons of color and women. And one of the feedback we've received from this beta project is they love the mentorship, they love the plan they follow, but they have trouble having trust in the very beginning because they're usually paired with somebody, even in the same organization, that they just don't know very well mm -hmm. because it's usually a higher up person and then a, a lower associate type person. And there's, especially when you have that type of sensitivity mm -hmm. geared towards a underrepresented person who's probably paired with somebody who doesn't have the same qualities that they do, right. uh, how do you, build the foundation to have a launching of that mentorship or sponsorship um, with trust from the beginning? Do you, yeah. do you have training involved somehow separately or how do you open up that conversation early? Any recommendations on that issue? I, I can certainly see the value of having some training component, you know, for, for both, but certainly for your mentors to recognize uh, and have some sensitivity toward the space that the underrepresented attorney is coming from. Um, you know, you just can't go into these sort of situations with assumptions about, well, she's probably experiencing this or he's probably experiencing that. Um, so some sort of, and I don't like this phrase, but sensitivity training around the challenges of being underrepresented in the legal pro profession, I think, would be key. And y'all may be doing something like that. Uh, but I think that certainly needs to be an element of it, particularly if the people who are a part of this program are women and, and under, underrepresented uh, attorneys. Um, so I think that, that could be certainly helpful. Having trust from the beginning, that's going to be tough in any situation. That develops, that evolves. You know, I think approaching it less like I mentioned the, whole, the word transaction, where this is just something I'm sort of doing for the bar um, because I feel like I should, but, you know, I'm not maybe in it as, as sincerely or with, with the same level of genuineness, particularly with this population of attorneys as I should be, um, it's going to be difficult to have trust right from the beginning. That's just going to have to evolve over time.
but I think a lot of it stems from an appreciation for what attorneys, particularly in the categories you described, are experiencing in law firms and other legal settings is crucial to those mentorship relationships and giving it time to sort of evolve. And then if you're recognizing that it really doesn't feel like a good fit, then find, then making another match, not letting it go too far where it's somehow, you know, damaging in some ways, um, but checking in, I think that's another piece of mentorship programs, formal programs, is there needs to be sort of check-in periods. How are things going? How are, you know, early on, maybe frequently early on, and then less frequently as the relationship evolves, you know, by kind of the program administrators to see how that's going. And if it's not going well, then make those necessary, necessary adjustments. All right, no other questions? Well, thank you all again so much. I really appreciate it.